Well, welcome. My name is Joe Moharsik. I'm the Grand Knight of uh, our, uh, our Knights Council here, the South Hills Council. Um, we're excited that you are here. We want to thank uh, Father Mike Ackerman and the folks at Resurrection Parish for allowing us to be here tonight. Uh, we have a great night of it. So again, thanks for being here. I want to thank the group that uh, put all this together, uh, Chris Rebold, uh, Jimmy D'Ambrosio, Dave Barone, um, and Doug Durda, who's uh, the, the man behind the curtain. He's filming us tonight, um, so appreciate all of that. So the theme tonight is a journey of faith. Um, we have a couple speakers talk about their journey of faith, and then we're going to get into um, what you all came for, probably the pizza and the beer, right? So, so first up, uh, I'll introduce Chris Rebold. Chris Rebold will come up and he will uh, start some prayers and some uh, intentions that we'll be praying for tonight. Then when Chris is finished, we'll have uh, Deacon Russ White uh, will come up and uh, give us uh, some words of wisdom. So thank you all for being here and uh, relax. Good evening. <clears throat> we'll begin with uh, a block of uh, prayers and intentions before uh, Deacon Russ's uh, presentation. We begin as we begin all things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. For our priests, deacons, and consecrated religious, that they will receive the necessary graces to live their calling, and for an increase in vocations, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For a just and peaceful resolution of conflicts around the world, especially the war in the Ukraine, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the welfare of our wives, children, and others entrusted to our care, we pray to the Lord that all people will come to respect the sanctity of life from conception to natural death. We pray to the Lord. Lord For the repose of the souls of all the faithfully departed, particularly our departed family and friends, we pray to the Lord. Lord For the Knights of Columbus and the Emmaus Brothers Ministry, that their work will help the men of our community become better husbands, fathers, and witnesses to Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord and for all those intentions that we hold in our hearts, we pray to the Lord. Lord I'm now going to read a prayer for priests composed by John Cardinal O'Connor. O loving Mother of Mary, Mother of Priests, take to your heart your sons who are close to you because of their priestly ordination and because of the power which they have received to carry on the work of Christ in the world, which needs, needs them so much. Be their comfort, be their joy, be their strength. Especially help them to live and to defend the ideals of consecrated celibacy. Lord Jesus, we, your people, pray in a special way for Father Mike. You have given him to us for our needs. We pray for him and his needs. We also pray for all priests and for their needs. We know that you have made them priests in the likeness of your own priesthood. You have consecrated them, set them aside, anointed them, filled them with the Holy Spirit, appointed them to teach, to preach, to minister, to console, to forgive, and to feed us with your body and blood. Yet we know, too, that they are one with us and share our human weaknesses. We know that they, too, are tempted to sin and to discouragement as we are, needing to be ministered to, as do we, to be consoled 
and forgiven, as do we. Indeed, we thank you for choosing them from among us so that they understand us as we understand them. Suffer with us and rejoice with us, worry with us and trust with us. We share our beings, our lives, our lives, our faith. <clears throat> we ask that you give them this day the gift you gave your chosen ones on the way to Emmaus, your presence in their hearts, your holiness in their souls, your joy in their spirits, and let them see you face to face in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread. We pray to you, O Lord, through Mary, the mother of all priests, for your priests and for ours, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And now, Deacon Russ White to tell us a little bit about his faith journey. Good evening. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Um, I got an email from Chris a couple days ago that said, uh, should tell about my journey, um, what made me Catholic, what keeps me Catholic, um, and a little bit about my, uh, my call. Um, I am a deacon. Uh, I was ordained in uh, this past October, so a little over five months ago. Um, I am a convert to the faith. Uh, I was baptized Lutheran, raised Methodist, primarily because the Methodist church was closest to my house and my parents used it as a babysitting technique. They didn't go to church, they just sent me there. <laughs> um, but I was very active in the, in the Methodist church. Um, as I was in high school and growing up, and um, I went to uh, Jamonville, the, the camp up, up in uh, above Union, Uniontown quite a bit. Um, I remember one summer I was at, um, at uh, tennis camp up there, and we were in the chapel, and talking about the gospel, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And I just remembered sitting there for about a half hour wow, that is really cool. And something tugging on me. I didn't quite know what it was. Um, I should mention that my parents, or my mother especially, is very much anti-Catholic, which is another reason why I went to the Methodist church. It wasn't Catholic. We were devil, Catholics are devil worshipers. They reference Mary, they eat cookies in church and pretend it's Jesus. They have the wrong view on abortion. They have a wrong view on the Pope. They have the wrong view on everything. Um, so I was raised very much anti-Catholic. But my best friend in life was my next door neighbor. They had seven kids. They were very, very, very Catholic, had a very strong influence on me. Um, and then I started dating my wife um, when I was a sophomore in college, and she's, she is Catholic. Um, so I would come to Mass with her, and I was like, wow, this is kind of a weird religion. I don't, I don't know what they're doing with that sacrament. I don't know what's going on. Um, but when I was in junior and high, in college, I converted to Catholicism. Um, it was the Eucharist that got me here, ironically, I guess, from my background. Um, there aren't, any, there aren't any quantum physicists in here, are they? Okay, because you'll argue with me on this point. I was a, I was a chemistry major um, in, in college for a long time and working with mass spectrometers, trying to locate electrons and all kinds of goofy stuff like that. And I realized that atoms are 99.999, 13 nines, and a six empty space. That's a lot of empty space that we're made up of. If I convert that to time, so a one second thing happens and then 99.9999 time later, 317,000 years. That's a lot of empty space. And it occurred to me, why am I telling you this? Wow, there's a lot of space for God in there, isn't there? Um, so that kind of got me, that got my, that and coming to Mass with my, my girlfriend at the time got me thinking. And then I stumbled across this book in the Bible, John chapter 6. And I read it, and I reread it, and I reread it. And I was like, Jesus ain't lying. <laughs> that is 
that is truly the Eucharist. And that's what Catholics believe. I need to become a Catholic right now. Took six months, but, but that's when I, I, I converted to Catholicism. Um, the Eucharist also got me back to church. Um, my wife and I had an infant son that, that died in, um, in 1988. And we were rocked by that. And we left, walked out of the church, actually on Easter Sunday one year, for about a year. Um, and then Catholic guilt. So I, I inherited that when I, when I went through RCIA. Then we felt guilty about not coming to church. So on the third Sunday of Easter, I came back. You Emmaus guys might remember that. That's in year B, I believe it is. The Emmaus, the road to Emmaus reading, Luke. Um, and I was sitting probably where Terry Martin is. And Father Ken was behind the altar and he consecrated the host and he held it up. And it was like it burned a hole in my soul. It was so bright, it was just burning. And I was like, holy cow, he really wants me back. <laughs> I don't know what he wants me for, but he wants me back. Um, so it was the Eucharist that brought me back to the church. Then I got involved with um, Moore's Men. Dave Barron and I were just trying to figure out when that started. It was early 2000s, 20 some years ago. I was involved in that for five, about five years with Father Joe Cadori. Um, that led me to getting involved with the Appalachian mission trip. And I met a man by the name of Angelo Pampino. A lot of you Emmaus guys will know him. His son's in the seminary now. And John Stone had been trying to get me to go to Emmaus for 10 years. Angelo, I went down to the uh, CMF one year. Angelo comes up, hey Russ, big smile. You know, he always has that smile. Russ, I'm leading the next Emmaus. Can you come? Yes. John Stone's standing there like, what, what am I? <laughs> so I went April, two, April 2000, 2014, I went to my first Emmaus. And uh, Chris, you asked things that change your life. That changed my life. The Grams told stories. Stephen Mayer, I remember his story, or part of his story, telling, me, telling us to stop listening to the music that we're listening to. And I was thinking about the music I listened to. And since that time, I primarily only listened to Christian music. So that changed my life. Um, and I came home from the Emmaus weekend and my wife's like, who are you, what happened? And she had been hounding me to go, or pounding, asking me to go to Medjugorje with her. Um, for a couple years she was asking me to do that. And Emmaus, because, because of Emmaus, I was like, oh, okay, I'll go, to, I'll go to Medjugorje with you. Um, and then I had to talk to Father Joe Cadori because I was like, okay, it's not, it's not recognized by the church, but can, I, you know, can we go there as Catholics? And he's like, well, you go to Mass every day, you do um, adoration every day, <laughs> you pray every day, you can go to confession, what's so bad? I was like, okay, good enough for me. <laughs> um, so I went, um, and it was just an amazing, amazing, amazing experience, another life-changing experience. If you ever get the chance to go to Medjugorje, I highly recommend it, even if only for the prayers, the daily adoration. During my time there, I don't know, it kind of built up over the time, the time that I was there. I just felt like God's calling you. God's calling you to do more. Come do more, come do more, come do more. I'm like, okay, I don't know what that means. So we were leaving Medjugorje, flying back, sitting in the Frankfurt airport, and one of the, uh, Natalie, one of the pilgrims that was with us, my wife and I were sitting, we're at, it's in Germany, so of course we're eating um, pretzels and beer for lunch, right? 
<laughs> so my wife and I are splitting a pretzel. Natalie's sitting across the table from me, and she says, Russ, I have this very strong feeling that you're called to be a deacon. I'm like, me? <laughs> you did say my name, but are you talking to me? And, uh, and I was like, wow, okay. Then over the course of the um, next several weeks, I've had, I had several other people say, have you ever thought about being a deacon? Jay and, Jody, Jay and Judy Shock were one of them. Um, and I thought, oh, okay. Maybe I better start thinking about this because I hadn't to that point. So I, I decided, okay, I'll think about it. Perhaps I'll apply. And I went to, at the time, uh, it was Father Mark, not Bishop Mark, but Father Mark Ekman was living at St. Bernard's in Mount Lebanon. And I went out to see him one day for Friday Mass because I knew he was saying Mass and I needed to talk to him. After Mass, I, I would go into the sacristy. It's like, Father Mark, hey, Russ, how are you? I was like, I got a question for you. I'm thinking about applying for the diaconate. And he laughed his head off. And I was like, uh oh, bad idea? He's like, no. When I left St. Thomas More, I left a note in the desk with two names of people on it that I thought should be deacons, and you were one of them. I was like, okay, I gotta apply. Um, and I still wasn't sure I was called but I knew I was called to apply for the diaconate, um, which Joe can, <laughs> Deacon Joe can tell you, it's a rigorous process. I mean, you've got to write a spiritual autobiography, 25 pages, um, part of which I've already told you, but imagine 25 pages of that. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, I know, I know I'm called to apply to the diaconate. And then um, several months later, I got a, I got a letter saying, that I was accepted into the diaconate, and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> still not sure. Um, so I started, and I prayed over it, and um, spent a lot of time in the Adoration Chapel, prayed over it, prayed over it, um, got to the point where, okay, I might not be called to be a deacon, but I'm called to start this process. Um, and it took five and a half years. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, there's some ups and downs. I went through a couple of periods or a couple of years of, um, I'll call it spiritual dryness, where I was praying and I wasn't feeling anything. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, maybe he doesn't want me. And then I thought of St. Mother Teresa, who went through years and years and years and years and years without any um, nudges from God, but she kept doing his work. So to me that said, just keep doing what you're doing. And all along, I basically said, well, I'm not sure I'm called to be a deacon, but if God doesn't want me to be a deacon, there ain't no way that I'm going to be a deacon. Um, so that's really my story. I, I said I was ordained last October, um, lucky enough to be assigned to my home parish here. Um, so I work with Deacon Joe and, and Father Mike. Um, and that's really kind of a short story of my story. So, Peter, I think you're up next. Thank you. Good evening, brothers. Um, yeah, you know, listening to Russ, I realized over and over how God sets up this web of strange situations and puts the people in our life just to lure us closer to him, you know? It's, it's so wonderful. Um, now, my story um, is a little bit different because I grew up as a Catholic. I grew up, I was born in Poland, hence I talk funny. And uh, I grew up in a Catholic church. I got very good formation from my parents, both by, by speech and, and, and example. Um, church in Poland, Catholic Church in Poland, at that time was very vibrant and very youth-oriented, so I got tremendous formation. Um, and that lasted till my late teenage years, 
The troubles came when I realized that girls are pretty. And they truly are. And little by little, trying to become, rather try to follow the masculinity of a playboy, I just gave up my freedom. I became a slave to so many vices, you know, and, and addictions. And uh, for the next 10 years, I did everything just to ruin my life. Funny, funny fact is that during that time, I really liked to read one chapter from the Bible, Bible and that was 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Many of you know it's the, if I speak in angelic tongues, but I don't have love and so forth. And I tried to squeeze my lust in that love aspect in it, you know? Because I thought no one loves like I do, you know? So keep that in mind because that will reoccur in my story. So uh, when I was 26 years old, in that time, let me, let me say that too, in that time I, I knew something in me is dying. And I began somewhere deep inside to realize that I cannot break free. I'm becoming a slave. And I have no idea how to break that chain of events. It was agonizing. May 10th, 1988, I was 26 years old. I got on a plane and I came to Pittsburgh to meet some of the people that I knew just by phone. I came here for a week, maybe two. And one of those friends, son's fiance's best friend, did you get that? <laughs> Eleanor's son's Frank, Marilyn's best friend, was this brown-eyed girl, Donna. I didn't think shalala. <laughs> I don't like Van Morrison anyway. But uh, that was that was pivotal point in my life. Donna was very, um, very much grounded. You know, her both feet were, were on the ground and, uh, and she would not put up with any of Pierre's nonsense, you know? <laughs> and, and she didn't do it in a gentle way. But I knew it was good for me. And I started praying, I said, Lord, you need to help me because Donna can't change me, I can't change myself, but I know you can. And we got married 35, 31 years ago. We have four daughters. And that journey of cleaning the mess up began. It was very hard and very painful. But um, again, Lord puts these people in those situations in your life and just, just you know, catches you in that net so beautifully. Father, late Father Joe Felt, some of you maybe know him, who married us and baptized three of our four daughters, said, Peter, you know what? You should join Knights of Columbus. There is a group of good men. You will really enjoy them. So in 1993, I just realized today, 30 years ago, I joined the 3084. And I, that's where I met Larry. Mainly, uh, council was, the members were like older fellows, I have to say, but there were a few young guys. And as much as I enjoyed it, the life kind of starts intensifying. You know, we start having kids, and I started my own business. And after a couple, three years, I kind of drifted away, became very inactive. But I still start growing. I continue to grow in my faith. You know, I start opening those books that my mother from Poland was sending to me, and they were just crowding the shelves. And I start cracking them up, and, and I begin to fall in love with what our church teaches. And I couldn't get enough. And the whole Marian theology, you know, how Our Lady plays the role in the salvation and her, and her appearing, apparitions, and, and mystics. And I couldn't get enough. And I start really, really proceeding intellectually our faith. And it was wonderful. It was never enough. Somewhere in that time, I, I met great friends like Sam. And uh, then the MS, then CMF started. So 
our men's group was, in my opinion, to me, very influential, you know? Those guys who just trying to grow in faith and, and, and just marching with them was such a joy. Then Emmaus came. Three guys invited me, Mark Graham, Tom Johns, and John Townsend. And they didn't have to invite me. I was so ready. I used to go to, um, to the retreats at St. Paul because I, I just couldn't get enough. So, like, it's so funny because three guys were inviting me. Russ, where are you? <laughs> and all it took is just one, really, and I would be there. And the Emmaus was just phenomenal experience. One thing I remember, Sunday morning, I realized that I have so much to go. It was like sort of the illumination of conscience experience, you know, when I realized how much dirt there is everywhere still in my life. These were big things still that I had to take care of. That was, I think, 2007. May of 2007. Wasn't that the second retreat here? So many years ago, I just realized how, how you know, like stretched in time all this, all this story is. So I got involved like crazy in the mass. I couldn't get enough. Every retreat was better and better. Every, every new members that came in, they were like, I don't want to say idols, but I fed off so much from every guy. And a couple of years ago, I got to the point that nothing was happening. I, I had this feeling like I don't have nothing to go to confession to for. Like, you know, all this big stuff was God removed from my life. And, I'm, and I mean... Truly, God removed it because I tried and I couldn't when I started begging. I said, you have to take it away because I, I can't. And he, one after another, took it away. And now I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't do this so-called big stuff, but I know something is missing. And it feels so weird. And when Joe called me, I, I told you right away, I, I'm like in such a dry, not dry spot, like I know, I know I'm just about to derail, but I have no idea what's going on. So when Joe asked me to speak, I'm like, I have nothing to say. I want to be with myself and try to figure it out. But my immense experience taught me that if you are asked to speak, it's not a 50-50 deal, it's 100 and 100 deal. You're going to benefit yourself 100% from what you have to say. And hopefully there is going to be somebody who's going to benefit 100% from what you have to say. But the preparation for that, for what, for your, uh, you know, for your talk, if you open it, will lead you to tremendous discoveries. So I said, Joe, you know, I have to pray about it. Following night, I had adoration, and I said, Lord, what's going on with Peter? And I hear in Polish, if I speak in angelic tongues and I can do this and this and this, but I don't have a love, and I realize that's what it is. I don't know how to love. I can argue and try to pretend that I'm sharing the truth with you, but if you disagree with me, I don't like you, man. You know? It was so obvious, just like your experience, you know, in Medjugorje, it was so obvious. And then the fear came in. I'm like, how, how can I love like he loves? You know, I immediately start thinking about crucifix. I'm like, there's no way I can, <laughs> I can get there. And then I look at the Eucharist and I'm like, no, I want you to love like this. Look how vulnerable I made myself and available to everyone. To the point even of sacrilege. Can you do that? I guess. And immediately I start thinking about my mama. She's somewhere here, right there. And I said, every time I'm in trouble, I go to mama. I said, mama, you know how to love. 
and you are human, you know? So I start praying to her. That's why Thursday I said, yeah, I'll talk. I think I know what's going on. <laughs> Maybe I do have something to share, and I, hope, uh, and I hope you got something from that, from that experience. So if you are in the dry spot, like I was a week ago, or if you know what you need to do, but you're a little bit scared, I promise I'll pray for you, but I would like you to do the same thing for me. Right now, if we can pray to mom to show us how to do it. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, I'm going to introduce Father Mike. Now, Father, you're going to have to help me with this. So, Father Mike is a fourth degree member of the Knights of Columbus. So, normally we would say, Sir Knight, you know, Mike Ackerman. But we got to throw a father in there somewhere, right? So, where does that go? Is it Sir Knight Father Ackerman? Is that how it works? All right. So... <clears throat> Lifetime member, awesome. So, Father Mike's going to come up and talk here in a second, but it's been, a, it's been a, a wonderful honor for myself to get to know Father Mike through our Moors men that we have here at St. Thomas More, through, through our nights, and just really being um, an active and vibrant priest here uh, at, uh, at St. Thomas More. Sorry, St. Thomas More Church, Resurrection Parish. So, um, without any further ado, you don't want to hear me talk. Father Mike, would you join us? Well, thanks, everyone. I know I'm the last thing standing between you, wings, and pizza, so I hope, I hope that uh, I can keep you engaged for a little while. My story sort of combines a couple of the things you've heard already, um, but, but it's funny how God takes you on the path that he takes you. I mean, if, you're, if you're really open, God will move you how he wants to move you, and hopefully you'll see some of that in the story. I grew up, obviously, in a Catholic family. Uh, I grew up, uh, my parents got divorced when I was three, so I lived with my mother and my grandparents primarily, and I lived literally right next door to the Catholic Church and the Catholic school. So there was the Catholic Church, the grade school, and my house right there, right? So I probably served every wedding and funeral at St. Scholastica, probably from 1995 until 2003. I mean, I was at almost everything, right? So I was there all the time. I, I knew all the priests. I knew the ins and outs of the sacristy. And I thought, you know, I'm, I think I might be a priest. That was me when I was in grade school. You get to high school and you think, I'm never going to be a priest. There's no way I'm going to do this, right? You heard it before. You're like, wow, there's some really pretty girls here. I went to North Catholic High School, the old North Catholic, right? I thought, this is really great. I like sports. I like to make some money. You don't do any of that as a priest. I thought, that, that was a nice idea, but I'm not going to do that. You know, the funny thing is, and maybe you can relate to this, I grew up Catholic my whole life, but I never was really taught how to pray. And maybe some of you can be related to that, right? I always sort of thought you did what you did, and you just told God what you were going to do, right? Like, hey, God, I'm going I'm to be a lawyer. Isn't that nice, right? Hey, God, I'm going to be a doctor. Is, isn't that nice? I'm going to buy a, a Maserati. Isn't that nice? You're going to like that, right? And I thought, you know, I'm just going to, you know, Lord, I'm buying a Maserati. You're the best. Amen. Right? And I thought that was pretty much prayer, right? I went to church. I checked the box. It's time to watch the Steelers. Now let's get out of here. Right? You know, that's sort of like how my life operated. Not until I got into high school uh, did I actually realize you need to ask God what he wants. And here's what's funny. When I was a, a, a junior in high school, Father Dave Bonner, now Bishop Dave Bonner, came and he was the vocation director at the time. And he gave a presentation where he talked about inviting God into your life and said, you have to ask God what he wants. Well, that was novel to me. I thought, really? I never thought that. I've never said, Lord, what do you want from my life? Right? What do you want? So I thought, well, that's interesting. That's an interesting thought. Right? I'll just store that one away in the back and keep doing what I'm doing, right? Senior year comes along, and everybody seems to know what they're doing but you. I don't know if you ever had this experience, but you talk to everybody, where are you going? I'm going to Notre Dame, I'm going to Georgetown, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be a physicist, I'm going to be a scientist, I'm going to be... I'm thinking, some of these kids can't even spell their own name. How are they getting in Georgetown, right? But anyway, I'm thinking, okay, that's what they think, right? So I'm thinking, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with my life. None. Like, none whatsoever. And I remember it's the end of senior year. 
it's, it's April, and we had a retreat. I was in charge of campus ministry. I was sort of like the, the president of campus ministry. And so uh, if you went to a Catholic school, you know, a real Catholic school, there's no air conditioning, right? It was like an 85-degree day. There was, the chapel was boiling hot, right? It was a real experience, you know? And so they told me, go in and get the chapel ready. It was a nighttime. It was like a Wednesday night. Go down and open up the windows and start to get things ready in the, in the chapel, right? So I go down to the chapel. The, the, the retreatants didn't come over yet. I'm the only one in the chapel. And I remember there were three lights on. There was a light over the crucifix, over the altar. There was a light on the tabernacle, which is on one side, and a light on the Blessed Mother on the other. And so I thought, I'm going to try something new. So I go into the chapel. We didn't have pews. We had chairs with kneelers, right? I go up about halfway. I go into the middle. I kneel down in the middle. And I said, okay, Lord, I graduate in like six weeks. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. But you do. So what am I supposed to do with my life? Just tell me, and I'll do it. And I knelt there, and I put my head down, and I knelt there, and it was quiet, and I heard crickets outside, I heard horns honking, I heard people down the street at the bar screaming, right? But I heard nothing else. And I thought, well, that was worth a shot. No, I gave it a try. I go to get up, <clears throat> and under my foot, I hear a little rustling sound, right? I hear something like this. I thought, what's that? I reached down, no kidding, and there's a, looks like a bookmark. And I flip it over, and it says, the road to the diocesan priesthood, call Father Dave Bonner. And I thought, no, no way, uh-uh, that was just, that's a plant in the audience, right? So I threw that thing, out. I thought, well, that was a nice try, but I'm not going to do that, right? <laughs> so I said, I'm not doing that, right? So I, I said, well, I'm going to go to college. I had to go somewhere. So I'm going to go to Duquesne. What am I going to do with myself? I'm going I'm to teach. I like to teach. I, I enjoy teaching. You get the summers off. You don't have to work the weekend. It's a pretty good gig. I think it's going to be pretty, 35 years, I retire. It's a pretty good gig, right? So I figured that's what I'm going to do with my life. But I couldn't shake that thought from the chapel. It was always in the back of my mind. I get to Duquesne, and no kidding, two weeks in, there was a little Irish priest named Father Nace McCool, who I swear no matter where I went, he was there. Right? At orientation, he's at the end, and I'm there in the line, and he's waving, and I'm just like, yeah, hi, hi, you know, just get my packet and go out of here, right? Next thing I know, I'm walking down the academic walk, and I hear him yell, yoo-hoo, and he's waving. I said, hi, nice to see you, Father, right? Nice to see you, Father. Next thing I know, I'm in the cafeteria. There he is. He's like literally right there. He just appeared, I swear. And he goes, you, are you a freshman? I said, yeah. He goes, you should join the Knights. And I said, the what? He goes, the Knights. I said, the Knights of what? He goes, the Knights of Columbus. I said, you mean the men with the plumed hats and the sword? I said, no, I'm not, do no, I'm not doing that. And he goes, you could be a knight. No kidding. No matter where I went for the next two weeks, he was there. If I was at the basketball game, he was there. If I was in class, he was walking down the hall. It was unbelievable. So finally, he gave me this little thing. He's like, you better come tonight, 9 o'clock to join the Knights. So I went. And it was very impressive. Not only was it impressive, but it was guys my age that wanted to live a faithful life and that spent time praying and that spent time going to Mass and adoration and it started to kind of change my life. I'd never really gone to adoration before that. And now I started to go with this group of guys to adoration and starting to have a little bit of an effect on me. And Father McCool, he would always say, now guys, we're going to pray the rosary every day. And I thought, that's a long prayer. Like, that's a lot of praying, right? And he goes, you're going to, you're going to pray the rosary every day, right? And he'd give us all these rosaries. And I remember he'd see you on the He'd see you on the walkway, and he'd go, did you pray today? And I'd go, no, and he'd go. Right? So I'm like, all right, I get it. I get it. I'll start, okay? So I start praying the rosary every day, and pretty soon I, f I start finding myself going to the chapel mass every day at Duquesne. And I'm thinking, what is going on here, right? What is going on here? And he goes to me one time, what do you think you're supposed to do with your life? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to be a teacher. He goes, no, what are you supposed to do with your life? What does God want you to do? I said, I don't know, Father McCool. I said, I, I thought about a whole bunch of things. And he goes, what, did you ever think God could be calling you to something? I said, it's funny you say that. I used to think once in a while about the priesthood. He goes, oh, he goes, you have to be open. You have to be open. And I said, well, I don't think that's for me. He goes, are you open to what God wants? And I started to think, you know, I'm not really, not so much. And he said to me, I'll never forget this. You have to be willing to embrace sacrifice if you want to discover God's plan for you. 
I remember thinking, whoa. At first I said, you mean like giving up candy for Lent? He's like, no, I don't mean just that. He's like, I mean, you have to be willing to sacrifice yourself if you want to get to where God wants you to be. And it starts to blow my mind. It blows my mind. And so I start to think, okay, I, I got to really be open about this. I got to really start thinking. I graduate Duquesne. Still thinking, could it be priesthood? Could it be something else? I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to graduate. I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to try to be a teacher. So I go to be a high school teacher, right? And it's funny, at this time, my home pastor, uh, who eventually became one of my very good friends, God rest his soul, Father Tony Gargata, who just died in, in December. Great, great priest, but a really great friend of mine. He became the pastor at our parish, the new pastor at the parish. And he came in the early summer. So I'm, I'm a teacher, right? He comes in the early summer. I'm just like a brand new teacher. And he started a, uh, an evening mass. Mass had been at 9 o'clock during the day, right? That was great for the old people, but I couldn't get there, right? You know, when you're working, you can't do that, right? So he starts a Wednesday night, 7 p.m. mass with all-day adoration leading up to it, which is very big, very huge. And the first mass he does, he has this Wednesday mass. I'm there, right? And there's, there's a decent number of people. And he goes, the mass is ended. Go in peace. Thanks be to God, right? And then he looks over. I'm sitting over there, and I see him go, Did he just point to me and give me the halt sign? So I thought, I'm getting out of here. So I did. So I left. I got up and I ran out the door, right? So the next week, he does the same thing. He ends the mass, and I see him go. So I can leave again. Right? I'm like, I'm not, I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what this guy's doing. Like, I'm, I just came from mass, right? No kidding. The third week, he ends the mass, and he runs down the altar, and I see him coming for me. So I'm like, oh. So I said, so I'm like, I'm looking around, and he's going, hey, wait. <laughs> so he comes over. I said, uh, hi, Father. Well, welcome to the parish. He goes, hey, I heard you're a teacher. I said, yeah, I am a teacher. He goes, that, that's what you do for a living. I said, yeah. He goes, great. I need an eighth grade CCD teacher for next year. I said, no, 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 no. I said, eighth grade. I said, I'm a high school teacher. I don't teach eighth grade. He goes, you can do it. It's the same. I said, no, they're like demons. I'm not teaching eighth grade. They, they scream. They yell. They can't sit still. He goes, I want you to be a teacher. You're gonna, can you teach for me? I said, I don't think so. And then a Catholic guilt you hear about, he goes, that's okay. The parish will have to find a way somehow. But I just felt the Lord tell me that you'd be a great teacher. I thought, all right, I'll be the teacher. All right, I'll do it. Fine, sign me up. So here comes the fall. I start teaching eighth grade CCD, and I love it. I start to find I enjoy it more than what I'm doing in the classroom uh, for, for every day, right? And I'm planning these lessons, and I'm doing these things. And October comes around, and Father Tony goes to me, how's teaching going? I said, this is great. I said, we have, we have lessons on the Holy Spirit. We're doing all these things. And he goes, oh, I, I meant your job, like your day job. I said, well, that's all right. I said, but well, look at what you see what we're doing here on Sunday. We have this lesson we're going to go. We have a little retreat planned. And he goes, you have a little fervor for the faith, don't you? And I said, yeah. I said, this is exciting. And he goes to me, how's your life going? I said, it's, it's going okay. He goes, well, what do you think you're going to do with your life? I said, I don't know. I mean, things will fall into place. I'm young. I'm 23. Things will fall into place, Father. And he goes, again, did you ever think that God might be calling you to something else? I said, man, I've heard this before. I said, you know, actually, it's funny you say that. I said, I've actually thought that maybe I could be called to be something else, maybe, maybe even like the priesthood. And he goes to me, did you ever go on a retreat? I'd never go. I mean, I went on a retreat in high school, but it was like a daytime retreat where you, you just ate pizza and you weren't in class. You were just thrilled to be there. You know what I mean? I said, not really, no. He goes, oh, that's great. He gets a big grin and he goes, what are you doing two weeks from now, two weekends from now? I said, why is that? He goes, just tell me what your schedule looked like. Can you get it clear? I said, yeah, I think I can get it clear. And he goes, good. I'll call, you, I'll call you this week. He calls me that week. That was a Sunday. He calls me on Thursday. He goes, I have that weekend planned for you. You're going to go to St. Paul Seminary. I said, oh, and do what? He goes, you're going to go to what they call the come and see weekend. I said, come and see. What are we going to go come and see? And he goes, it's for guys thinking about being a priest. I said, no, 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 I'm not doing that. He goes, oh, yeah, you have to try it. I said, no, Father Tony, that's too much. And he goes, just go once. Just go one time and see. If it's not for you, if you, if you feel out through the course of the weekend, it's not your call, then no harm, no foul. 
We can have a good laugh about it. We can go out for a nice steak dinner. We can laugh about it, and you can just let it go, right? You got to just try one time. It's pretty persuasive. I thought, all right, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. So I'm, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. I just said, I'm going away for the weekend, right? Where are you going? Away. Where are you going? Away. Oh, we'll call you. You can't. There's no phones there. None. There's no electricity. Nothing. You can't get me. I'm just gone for the weekend, right? I get there. At the time, this is a blast from the past for the St. Thomas More folks, Father Jim Wainer was the rector, right? And so Father Jim gets up. We start on a Friday night. And his first talk, he goes, I bet you're wondering why you're here. I thought, yeah. He goes, I bet you think this is crazy. I'm like, some of you are probably wishing you didn't come. I'm like, yes. This man speaks my language. And he goes, well, that's good, because God wants you here. I thought, oh. He goes, are you uncomfortable with where you are? I thought, mm hmm. And he goes, good. The Lord's speaking to you. I thought, man, why is he saying stuff like this, you know? And I kept thinking, I hope this weekend's terrible, but it wasn't. I started to enjoy it. I enjoyed mass. I enjoyed adoration. I enjoyed hanging with the seminarians. I enjoyed uh, going on uh, apostolic works. We did little, like, mission works with them. We went to masses on the Sunday at a parish, and I thought, uh-oh, I enjoy this. And at the end of the retreat, I remember I was sitting in the chapel at the seminary, and the guys had left, and I was still there. And Father Jim came in, and he goes, uh, you know, the retreat's over. You can go home. I said, oh, oh, it is. He goes, oh, are you enjoying your time here? And I said, oh, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know. And the next thing I know, there's a folder that drops on next to me. It's an application packet. He goes, just read through that. Tell me what you think. I thought, I don't know about this. I go home. I look at that packet. There was so much stuff. I thought, man, this is like the FBI clearances. I, I probably can work on a nuclear missile silo by the time I get through this thing, right? But I couldn't. The more I kept flipping through it, the more I kept picturing myself there. And there was another come and see I went back for, and it was even better than the first. And before I know it, I'm thinking, uh-oh, I think I'm called to be a priest. I think I'm actually going to do this. And here I find myself, I'm thinking, I'm 23, now 24 years old. I have a job. I'm living on my own. I'm having a pretty good life. And I'm going to give all that up and be a priest. And the first time I said that out loud, I thought, actually, I think I want to do that. I think that's what God wants me to do. And there became such a joy that I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. It was like, this isn't my own idea. It's not my own idea. There was something about it that, that, that couldn't be pulled away. And it's funny, the closer I got to actually go into the seminary, the craziest stuff happens. You don't think you're going to be tempted. You are, right? I had a job offer that came from another school district for more money. I thought, whoa. I had a job offer to work at a firm. I was, I was also a business major. I had a job offer to work in, in uh, finance, which was a very well-paying job. I thought, ooh. This old girl that I would date would call me and be like, hey, do you want to get back together? I'm like, what is going on here? This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Like, what is going This is crazy, you know? But I kept thinking, no, this has to be what God's called me to do. And, and I really think, you know, at that point forward, I realized this is what God's asked, and I, I got to say yes. Is it always easy? No, it's not. Uh, Deacon Russ said it well. Are there ups and downs in the seminary? Yes, there are. The first week of the seminary, I got there the first day. I thought, this is the greatest thing ever. By Friday, I thought, how do I get out of here? I, this, I don't know what philosophy is. I don't know how the breviary works. I got to go home. This is, this is not my place, right? But if you stick with the Lord, he guides you through. He gives you what you need. And so I always say to people, pray and ask God. Be open. Be willing to sacrifice. Be willing to sacrifice your own wants, your own ideas, your own agendas. If you do that, if you're open, God will speak to your heart and he'll guide you. Uh, I got ordained in, in, as a deacon in 2013 and as a priest 2014, and it's been a wild ride. This is, my, this is my sixth assignment, if you can believe that, nine years. This is my sixth assignment, uh, but I can say there's no better, no better joy than serving the Lord. No, no better joy than anything that, that you could possibly imagine. So I would just encourage anyone in your life, Pray and be open. Let the Lord speak to you. And even in the most bleak, difficult, obscure circumstances, God's still working. God's still speaking. Just have confidence in that. So trust that the Lord has guided you and let him speak. God bless you guys. Well, thank you, Father Mike. I, um, first of all, thank you for being here today. There's a card. Also, when you became pastor here, we found out that you were a knight. We, you know, the, our council got very excited, so we knew we had to get you a gift. Um, so I'm not going to let you open it. Um, Is it the plume, huh? 
It is not the plumed hat. That's, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. So this is a Knights of Columbus chasuble and stole for you. Uh, we hope to see it every Sunday, Father, so you can uh, support the Knights of Columbus. So on behalf of our council, thank you very much. Yeah, and welcome. Thank you Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. I got a few remarks, folks. You know, it's interesting. I, I was taking notes here on what all three of our speakers were talking about today. Um, I wasn't just doing my uh, giant eagle list, I promise. Um, but what everyone said, there's some themes. I hope some of you probably got this too. One was prayer. They all talked about prayer, right? Talked about their prayer life, talked about what they prayed for, and how God worked through them through prayer. Scripture. Everyone talked about Scripture, talked about the Word, and searching. All three of them were searching for something, right? Peter found his wife, even though he wasn't really looking for her, maybe, you know. Father Mike found ultimately the priesthood, and uh, Deacon Russ uh, found his way back to Catholicism and, and, and into being a deacon. Um, so they all found one person that brought them to their calling. And Father Mike, one of the, the first words you said, I wrote down, if you're open, the Lord will move you. I love that. That's a, that's a fantastic thing. So when we talk about the Knights of Columbus. Is it? So I grew up in the Knights of Columbus. My dad was in the Knights. He was a grand knight. He did all this stuff. All the, he has the plumes, the swords, the whole bit. He's still bitter that he can't wear them anymore. Um, but um, to me, it was a bunch of old dudes that sat around and, 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 you know, I grew up in Indianapolis and our council had a, a bar room and they just sat around and ate peanuts and drank beer. Um, so I didn't get to see all the, the good stuff, but we were there all the time. And, and, and as kids, we did the Easter egg hunt there. We did whatever it was. Mom would roll her eyes when we would leave. Um, and it was great. And it was a good time that I got to spend with my dad, just us guys. Um, so in 90, 1998, I was uh, 22 years old. Um, you know, I went through my degrees, my, my third degree, so I've been a knight for that long. As soon as I left, I, I, I never set foot in a council again. Um, I never paid my dues. We get those, those uh, arrears um, notices in the mail. My dad would end up paying them after about three or four years, say, what the heck are you doing? Um, but it wasn't until I came here that I got active again with the council that's here. And, you know, as you walk in those doors over there, here at the church, there's a big table there. It's got a big fake plant on it. It's a beautiful, a lot of information around it. But it's a three-legged stool. Sam just told me that today. We just talked about that. You know, on a three-legged stool, four-legged stool, you can take a leg away and it won't fall. It'll be a little wobbly, a little weird. It won't fall, though. But three-legged stool, you take a stool away, you're going to fall. The table's going to fall. Those beautiful flowers will be on the floor, and all the information about what's going on at church will be all over the floor. So I like to think in my life, and several of us, the three-legged stool for me is the Knights of Columbus, been a part of me my entire life, a transitional mountaintop tipping point for me was going on an Emmaus retreat. And then the third thing was Moore's Men. So Moore's Men, a little plug for this since I, uh, we, we do this every Tuesday morning, 6 a.m. I know it sounds absurd. I always thought it sounded absurd. Now that I have kids and my daughter gets up at 5.15 every morning, so 5 o'clock isn't that early for me to get up. But uh, 6 a.m. we meet here. We talk about the Scripture. We talk about how God, one of the things they all talked about, how God is speaking to us in our lives, and we study Scripture in our Catholic faith. So I'm plugging all three of those things today. Um, our, our St. Thomas More, well, it used to be St. Thomas More Resurrection Parish in Pittsburgh, Emmaus. It's been active. It's been around for a long time. Um, there's some change going on locally. We're getting a new ministry head. Um, we're working towards some things. And in fact, Corky would be mad at me if I didn't bring it up. We have an event here. Um, it will not be here. It'll be at St. John Capistran, Capistran Hall. On uh, April 1st, no fooling, 7 p.m., come out and uh, watch some of the uh, March Madness and uh, have some food and meet some guys. Don't have to be an Emmaus brother, but if you are, it'd be great. We'd love to get uh, together with you for that. And then Moore's Men, 
Real simple thing, we even zoom in. So if you're uh, still laying in bed, I remember, I don't know if he's here, Paul Hannon, I, so we usually just go around the room if anyone has any remarks, they can say them. And I called on Paul Hannon, and Paul was all flustered, and he called me afterwards. He goes, don't ever call me again. I said, okay, no big deal. You know, we just do as we do. He goes, I was in bed, and, and my wife was there, and she's like, what are you talking about? Like, why are you talking? He had his, his, his earbuds in. He was laying in bed. I said, well, I guess however you're going to come to it, you can come to it. He hasn't come back, actually. Um, we need to get him back. And then the Knights of Columbus. So if you're not a member of our council, um, I'd love you to be. You know, we, we do a lot of fun stuff. We, we're a very active council. We love to serve our community. The three things we spend most of our time and most of our money on is protecting life, is Catholic education, and we've adopted to work at, at the food bank at St. Winifred's. We encompass four different parishes throughout the South Hills here. Uh, anyone can be a member. And if you come talk to me today, you can get in for free. Or anybody can get in for free. Uh, the first year's free. So um, we do these things three times a year. Um, I think they're pretty awesome. We've been at St. Louis. We've been at um, St. Valentine's, and now we're here today, uh, which is great. Our council meets uh, usually every first two, uh, Wednesday of the month. We meet in Harkins Hall at St. Anne's Church, which is directly underneath the sanctuary there at, uh, at, at St. Anne's. We're there for a few more weeks or months until uh, their renovation projects kind of kick us out for a little while. So uh, we're excited about that. Um, our, uh, our folks just recently, I, I see Bob Hankels over there. Um, Mary Hankels called me one day, and if you don't know Mary, um, you, you, you'll meet a saint if you meet Mary. Uh, Mary called me. She, she is the one that runs the Adoration Chapel here. And um, she said, you know, I've been thinking about you, Joe. It's almost like the, that priest, you know, Mary kept kind of showing up. Um, I said, well, why is that, Mary? She goes, well, the knights are such great people. I said, oh, no, I agree. She goes, you guys are, you know, like in the image of St. Joseph and and, you know, and it was last year she was talking to me, this is the year of St. Joseph, and you men are like such strong pillars of our community, just like St. Joseph was, and your name is Joseph. And, and I said, what's going on, Mary? She goes, we have this hour on, on Wednesday mornings from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. that we've never been able to, to, to fill. She goes, will your, will your council adopt that? I said, Whoa. I said, that's pretty hard to do. She goes, you have hundreds of members. I said, I, I do know that. Um, so I brought it up to our officers. There's about 15 of us that are officers. Brought it up to an officers meeting. Everybody said, oh, yeah, that, that would be great. I said, all right, let's sign up. Those crickets you were talking about. They didn't hear from anybody. So then I said, okay, I'll do the first one. I'll lead by example. And I did the first one. It was rough. I had to get up. My wife's wondering what the heck I'm doing at 2 in the morning to get up. And, uh, and it was a, a fantastic, of course, time, never, never a bad time in the Adoration Chapel. So then, you know, we kind of went through a few weeks, and, and folks have been doing it. And then um, it's just such, to me, it's been such a blessing. It's been such a blessing, too, because no one's missed it yet, because I'm the one that they're going to call if someone misses. So um, thanks to all the guys here who have signed up. But you come a night. You don't even have to be a night. You can be a part of our Adoration Hour. Uh, it's a good time um, from Tuesday on uh, I always screw it up. It's Tuesday overnight, Wednesday morning, right? So anyway, we also have, if you want to join, or if you are a member and you're not a third degree member, we have a degree ceremony coming up this uh, Sunday. It'll be at St. John Capistran after the 11 o'clock Mass. So if you've been around for a while, you know the degrees have changed a little bit. They used to be kind of long. There's three degrees. The fourth degree is something totally separate. It used to be long. It's a 25-minute ceremony. You can get all three of them done right there. Um, it's meant to be more welcoming for those to be a part of our council. So we'd love to have you there. Again, there'll be free food there afterwards. So come on out. If, you're, if you want to join tonight, you can join and be there. Try not to sell this too hard, am I? All right. Um, and then also, those of you who um, are a part of the Emmaus community, there's a retreat that's going on this weekend uh, coming up. Um, and uh, there's in some need of some overnight ador adorers that do adoration there during the retreat. So you can see Larry Aiken right here in the, you want to raise your hand, Larry? 
Larry Aiken here in the blue shirt or blue jacket, and he can get you signed up for an overnight adoration time. So I want to thank you all for being here, of course. I don't want to be the one to stand between you uh, and pizza wings and, and the thing that uh, didn't get in the bulletins and didn't get in some of the websites, but there's free beer over there too. So we're here for that too. So God bless you all. Thank you for being here. If you head on over into the Family Life Center, there's information about the nights. I think Dave's got some sacramental stuff over there. We have these wonderful prayer altars that we've been given out at some of our churches, and they'll be continuing to happen. The Knights are sponsoring that. Um, it's a way for you to take some sacramentals home to your family to pray, um, and we would love to give those to you. So you can follow Mr. Barone like the Pied Piper that he is right on over to the Family Life Center. So thank you all. Thank you, Father.